to see the culmination of the first faculty fellowship. We want to thank everyone who has been involved in the planning of today's event. We also want to recognize the School of Education and Dean Joanna Masangila for her continued support of the Linder Center. I also want to acknowledge and express with deep appreciation, Helene and Marvin Linder. It is their vision, their persistence and their generosity that has helped to shape and move the Linder Center for Social Justice forward. As a central hub on SU's campus dedicated to social justice, we aspire to foster proactive, innovative and interdisciplinary approaches related to justice, equity and inclusion through various activities and programming. Central to our work has been the support of the faculty and student fellowships, which involve two year research projects for student teams led by a faculty fellow to critically and creatively explore contemporary social issues, develop innovative approaches to these problems and implement useful and sustainable initiatives. So today we will witness the culmination of the work of our first inaugural faculty fellow, Dr. Kazare Abdugani, Assistant Professor of African American Literature and Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences, along with an amazing group of Lender Student Fellows. Their project is the Social Justice Hashtag Project, a digital humanities study. And before we hear about their projects, we are excited to welcome Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, who will provide our keynote address. He will be introduced by literacy education doctoral student and Linder Center graduate assistant, Evan Starling Davis. Before we move to the heart of today's program, I want to express gratitude for the experiences and opportunities that I have had over the past four years as one of the inaugural co-directors of the center. But I knew that my time would eventually come to an end I would like to pass the mic and welcome my colleague, Dr. James Haywood Rowling Jr., a dual prof professor of arts education in the College of Visual and Performing Arts and in art education and teaching and leadership in the School of Education, who will beginning this fall replace me as the next co-director for the Linder Center, working alongside with my partner, Dr. Kendall Phillips. James lives a life dedicated to diversity, equity and inclusion, and we are so excited for all that he will bring to the center. There is a wonderful write-up about James, his work, and his new appointment that was just released um, in the SU News today, so definitely check that out. And I think James is there. You can wave and say hello to everyone. So welcome, James, to the Linder Center for Social Justice. Thank you. Um, I Were you going to add something? Oh no, yeah, no. I just, I just want to thank. Uh, 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 no one replaces you. I, 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 just, <laughs> I, just, I just come, I just come in to, 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 uh, to uh, fill your seat for a bit. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, Marvin and Helene Lender for their generosity and both providing the gift that launched the Lender Center and for their faith and what I bring to the table as the next co-director. And I look forward to. Uh, making a contribution going forward during my term. So I, I'm very inspired by what's about to happen today. And I, I'll leave it at that. And thank you so much. Thank you, James. We we're really excited to have you um, become a part of the Linder family. So now um, we're um, happy to have a few words from our Chancellor, Chancellor Kent Subaru. Good afternoon. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person to welcome you. Today is a wonderful milestone for the Lender Center for Social Justice. In just a little more than two years, and despite all of the challenges we have faced with COVID-19, the center and its faculty and students are well on their way to realizing Marvin and Helene Lender's vision. This symposium is a big part of that vision. It is the opportunity to welcome wonderful scholars like Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of African and African American Studies at Duke University. Professor Neal's model of public scholarship is a tremendous example of how great universities can foster real-world engagement and impact. 
The Lender Center's mission was stated clearly by Marvin and Helene Lender at the dedication in 2018. The Lender Center seeks to create a hands-on experience for undergraduate and graduate students interested in social justice that crosses academic disciplines. While this sounds simple, realizing the work has taken planning, outreach, and coordination. It has taken the dedicated work of many faculty members, including the Center's first co-directors, Professor Marcel Haddix of the School of Education and Professor Kendall Phillips of the College of Visual and Performing Arts. A core part of this effort is to have our students work closely with one of our outstanding Syracuse University faculty members on a project with real-world implications. Today, you will hear from our inaugural Lender Faculty Fellow, Professor Cesare Gibson Abdulgani. You'll also hear from several of the first cohort of Lender Student Fellows. These students represent three different colleges at Syracuse University. They come from multiple majors and very different educational experiences. They share a common commitment to social justice. Over their lifetimes, Marvin and Helene Lender have worked to elevate the voices of others and educate us all about the tragedy of prejudice. They have supported Syracuse University with their advice and their philanthropy. So today, I hope that the Lenders and all of us will take a moment to reflect on what our first Lender Faculty Fellow and Lender Student Fellows have accomplished. We are so proud of them. This work is more important now than ever we can all be proud of the work that is being done at Syracuse University's Lender Center for Social Justice. Thank you all for being with us here today. And thank you, Chancellor Subaru, for your words. And I'd like to now uh, recognize again, Helene and Marvin Lender and invite them to say a few words. Um, thank you very much. Um, Bring your camera on. Oh. Uh oh. It's a start again. Oh, oh. The call has start my video. Go back to the camera I had last night. You're there. Oh, okay. Thank you. I was blaming it on Helene, as we know. When I <laughs> I'm the one who turned it off, but I blamed it on my wife. And I, anyways, I just did the initial thank you to everyone who you've just met, uh, and Marvin will now do the official thank you for all of you who uh, we're pleased to have joined us today, which is a very special day for us all. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, let me just take two minutes and also thank uh, a number of people who have brought us to this day, which um, for us is a, the beginning of a dream come true. And um, uh, Kazare, first of all, I met you two and a half years ago and I didn't even understand what the hashtag meant. But clearly, over the last two and a half years, I've learned all about that. And I'm looking forward to the work that you and Abigail and Andrea and Grace and Adriana have um, brought to the table today, um, as well as, of course, Kendall and Marcel. Uh, and as Helene said, we can't say enough about them. Um, there were two students, well, there's one now that's uh, Evan and Evan. Evan's predecessor, Hetsy, who really helped uh, in the background keep all of this together. Uh, and, uh, and we're very pleased, Dr. Neal, that uh, you are here today. I should say something uh, um, about the fact that uh, Marcel is rotating off and makes us very nervous, to say the least, because we have so much confidence in her. But I uh, had the opportunity to uh, to meet uh, James Rowling, uh, Professor James Rowling, uh, not too long ago, and uh, we're looking forward to him uh, continuing the work of um, uh, of the two co-directors, uh, who are spectacular. Um, the first group here, and what you have done, is going to have set a high bar. Uh, I I already have a, a hint 
at what you're going to provide for us today. And I should also tell you, uh, Marcel, Kendall, that the first is always remembered. And all of you are the first in what I hope will be a lifelong um, existence of uh, the, the Lender Center, <clears throat> which, um, as you know, uh, we have funded in perpetuity because we know the problems of social justice are not going away this year or next year or the year after. And therefore, Helene and I and our family, uh, our kids and, and our grandchildren and great grandchildren, we don't even know yet, uh, are going to be committed to this. Um, this was a tough year. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it a lot, but I know how tough it was to do the kind of work that you're doing on Zoom and not being able to interact with one another personally. Uh, so it, it made the job a lot harder. But uh, I know it's going to be great. And uh, again, we will forever be indebted to all of you who uh, are behind the scenes here. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words and again, for your support and confidence um, in us to bring this project to fruition. I'd now like to invite Evan Sterling Davis, who will introduce our keynote. Hi, I'd like to express my gratitude working in partnership with the Lender, uh, the Lender Center's leadership. When stakeholders and resources aligned with critical thought and scholarship, we're able to provide space for voices crucial to our progress towards social justice and equity. Today, I'm extremely honored and humbled to introduce one of those voices, our keynote speaker, Dr. Mark Anthony Nell. Dr. Nell is chair of the Department of African American Studies and the founding director of the Center for Arts, Digital Culture and Entrepreneurship at Duke University where he also offers classes and courses on Black masculinity, popular culture, digital humanities, um, as a professor of African-American studies and English. A Bronx-born feminist with an in-depth perspective of Black culture, his scholarship archives and highlights the complex identities of Blackness, which represent and distort conventional motifs. Dr. Neal is the author of What the Music Said, Black Popular Music and Black Public Culture, Soul Babies, Black Popular Culture in the Post-Soul Aesthetic, New Black Man, and Looking for Leroy, Illegible Black Masculinities. He's also the co-editor of That's the Joint, the Hip Hop Studies Reader, and the founding and managing editor of the blog, New Black Man, as well as the host for the ultra dope um, webcast, Left the Black, which is produced in collaboration with the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke University. If you never watched that uh, that webcast, Left for Black, I highly urge you to do so. Dr. Nair's curation of critical conversations has deeply impacted my life. I'm forever grateful. I see your work, your advocacy, your eyes on the past, present, and future as an important model we can all follow as stewards of culture. As you said, where the humanities are at this moment nationally, it is important for humanities-minded entities to begin to pull resources and collaborate in support of the value of humanities. Dr. Mark Anthony Nell, everyone. Thank you very much, Evan, for that wonderful introduction. And I am also thankful for this opportunity uh, to keynote uh, this first gathering of the Linda Center uh, for Social Justice, um, the first gathering of the first cohort of teaching faculty uh, fellows and also student fellows. Uh, my presentation today really is going to deal with thinking about the idea of social justice and digital media, not so much in the content, but actually in the practice of thinking about social media. And I'll start by, of course, sharing my proverbial screen. The title of the talk today is If You Don't Own the Servers, curating, aggregating, and doing Black studies in the digital era. Uh, please feel free to follow me on Twitter at New Black Man, and feel free to tweet comments about today's presentation. And you can follow me on IG at Booker BBB Brown. The title, If You Don't Own the, Own the Servers, is a remix of a comment that Prince Rogers Nelson made about 20 years ago. Some of you might remember that there was a period of time when Prince had changed his name to something unpronounceable, a symbol. And he wrote two things that when he would show up publicly, he wrote on one cheek master and on his other side, he wrote 
slave. And, and when journalists would ask him what he was talking about in that regard, his response was, if you don't own the masters, specifically talking here about master recordings, the master owns you. And I wanted to place that in the context to think about the ways in which social media in particular has been used in terms of social, in terms of social justice work in that we all do interesting things with applications, right? But the real power still resides in those folks who actually own and maintain the servers. I wanna start by giving acknowledgement to the people who inspired me to do the work that I do. Um, when I was growing back up in, in New York City in the 1960s and 1970s, early 1980s, I was fortunate to have access to a public affairs program called Like It Is. Um, the program was hosted for nearly 30 years by New York City journalist Gil Noble. Uh, Gil Noble got to position in the aftermath of all of the upheaval of the 1960s. And so many local radio stations and television stations understood the need to be able to have a more diverse perspective in the media. And he was able to launch like it is in 1968 because of these pressures. And I always think about the work that Gil Noble did because it was because of Gil Noble that I was introduced to a wide array of African-American figures. The first time I ever saw visibly, right, a, a visual of Malcolm X's speaking was on Gil Noble's show. The first time I heard anything about, you know, Paul Robeson, uh, we're seeing footage on Gil Noble's show. Uh, so I always want to acknowledge his role in getting me to think about media uh, in the context of the work that I do. The other person I want to shout out for inspiration is this character here, uh, depicted from a television, from a comic strip uh, known as Doonesbury in the 1980s. Uh, it is Oliver Wendell Jones. And we have heard so many conversations over the last 20 years about a digital divide and the fact that you know, there aren't more of a diverse presence of people of color, um, particularly folks who are doing work uh, you know, around digital technologies. Oliver Wendell Jones was a character that was created by Burke Breath uh, for Doonesbury, or Gary Trudeau rather for Doonesbury. And as a 10 year old, uh, he is on his Wang computer, which at the time was cutting edge technology, um, trying to figure out how to hack the federal government. Um, and that always struck me as a kind of interesting figure because he reminds me of kind of the ghost in the machine that have existed um, before there was a full realization of things like black Twitter. And then lastly, to give you some sense of, of who I am and the kind of work that I do, I consider myself a digital evangelist um, in terms of my commitment to using the digital sphere to do important work around social justice and doing the work of Black studies in particular. Um, and, and these are really my, my home bases. Um, I launched New Black Men in Exile as a blog back in 2005, and it really was initially simply out of the desire to create a space for me to be able to promote what was then my new book, New Black Man. Um, 16 years later, um, it has become a valuable resource a, to aggregate so many things that are interesting to me, obviously, but also more broadly to African-American studies, Black studies. Um, increasingly over the last decade or so, it's also became a space where younger scholars and graduate students have been able to write about things that they were concerned with. Um, as I tell folks about the work that I do around New Black Men and social media, about 75% of my presence in social media is pedagogical, um, doing the work of aggregating information to a broad public, um, as well as providing a platform for younger scholars and thinkers and artists to be able to share their work. Um, and of course, you know, the work that we do proverbially on Twitter um, and also Instagram. I wanna start with this image here, um, this idea of us beginning to dis demystify what we think about as social media. Uh, and I would argue that some of the most early examples of social media in American society actually occurred on plantations in the American South with enslaved Africans um, who will very often use messaging um, in songs and other forms of speech that was unique to a particular learning community and language community to be able to share messages with each other. So that for instance, when we think about classic spirituals like Go Down Moses, to understand that it, not was, it wasn't just a song that showed that the enslaved Africans were acquiescing to 
Christianity in the South in the face of white supremacy, very often the song like this contained messages, right? A layering where go down Moses might have been a field or a cabin or a mountain, a cave, a few miles down the road where folks were going to meet to think about a way to get out of the conditions that they were in. And in fact, these language practices of social media and in singing and songs and work songs and field songs in the early forms of the blues, when we think about even hip hop in the later context in the, in the late 20th century, were already existing forms of social media that existed within the context of black cultural practices. I often go back and think about this essay that Farad, Fahad Manchu wrote in August of 2010 uh, for Slate. And it was a piece on how Black people use Twitter, because one of the things that emerged that was strange to some folks was that you had this new microblogging platform, and it was through this process of hashtagging that suddenly issues that were of concern to Black folks begin to bubble up as primary themes on social media, Twitter. Uh, and, and of course, we now refer to that as Black Twitter. But when we think about the earthquake in Haiti, uh, when we think about the Genesis six, when you think about Barack Obama's election, uh, when we think about the early days uh, with, after the shooting death of, of Trayvon Martin, um, folks were curious about the way that this micro blogging platform brand new was being used, utilized by black folks. And, and I was only struck by the title of this piece, how black people use Twitter because it almost suggested that Black folks were using the technology in a way that was so exceptional and odd that you would describe your family dog the same way, as if you were going how the family dog uses a cell phone. Um, it just seemed that it captured something that didn't make sense to folks who had created technology. But one of the reasons why Black Twitter exists is because of this concept called fictive kin. Um, and some of you might have had this experience before. You might be an African-American who's walking across campus with one of your white peers. Um, and a, another African-American walks by you and, and we do the thing that we instinctively do. We give a head nod, right? Or you know, if it's someone we might know a little closer, we might give a pound. Inevitably, your white friend will say to you, well, how do you know this person? And the black person will go, I don't. Um, and part of that curiosity comes from this idea of fictive kin that wherever there are Black folks, right, you acknowledge another Black person because in the absence of other Black folks, that's somebody that you're going to have to rely on, hence the term fictive kin. And what happened on Twitter is that many African Americans were more likely to follow people who were presented as Black on Twitter, creating a community within the context of these microblogging platforms. Another moment we might think about as a timeline of social media for Black folks is what if the Greensboro Four actually had Twitter? And it's a fascinating question because we could imagine all kinds of things that have occurred as we've seen so many Black folks being able as activists organizing over the last seven or eight years, particularly in the context of Black Lives Matter. But I would argue that while the Greensboro Four didn't have Twitter, they did in fact have social media and other forms in which they were using cutting edge technology to be able to send messages. One of the most important tools for the Greensboro Four generation for those early civil rights activists was a mimeograph machine, right? That allowed them to be able to mass produce flyers about gatherings and meetings and marches. Some of you might be old enough to remember the smell of, of mimeographed copies, that purple ink that instinctively, whenever your teacher handed it out to you, particularly if it was just produced, you would feel the need to feel the warmness of the paper and smell that indigo on those pages. Right? The way that this generation used things like the mimeograph machine and also to use independent black radio stations, the way that they use word of mouth, right, which is fundamentally what we should understand as social media. So even though they didn't have Twitter, they did have access to social media. When I think about what it was like for me growing up in the South Bronx in the 1960s and 1970s, early 1980s, what was social media for us was something called a mixtape, and, and not a mixtape as a facsimile or some digital playlist that gets circulated on social media today, but an actual 60 or 90 or 120 minute cassette tape um, in which we very often would do air recordings of music that we heard on the radio in the early days of hip hop these mixtapes, these cassette tapes recorded at open air performances in the park 
or in, or in community centers was the early way in which the sounds of hip hop circulated across the nation at a time where you could not hear hip hop on the radio yet. And in fact, if we go early prior to 1978, hip hop hadn't even been recorded as records yet but they were able to circulate this cutting edge new culture by using the mixtape as a vehicle of social media. And I want to talk a little bit about to double down on this concept of mixtapes, right? Particularly as it was important to me growing up 30 years ago. For me, those mixtapes were not just a reflection of my love of music, but recognition of the thoughtfulness that went into constructing sonic representations of my passions, desires, and moods. I always understood, even before I had the language to explain it, that these mixtapes represented my intellectual property. They were not simply songs thrown together randomly or in a sequence decided by some record company executive, but an attempt at meaning making that went well beyond the intent of the artists whose songs might have appeared on one of those tapes. And I'd be hard pressed to not think that so many of my generation that was making mixtapes felt that same kind of power in being, able to, in being able to create their own archives and their own intellectual property. And I wanna double down on this idea of the mixtape and hip hop and for a moment to DJ. Um, one of the really interesting figures around this conversation is the filmmaker, John Acomfra. Um, John Acomfra, who got his start making films in Britain in the 1970s, uh, 1970s he's of Ghanaian descent. Um, one of his first early documentaries was a film called The Last Angel in History, which centers on this figure, and this is 1992, right, which centers on this figure called the Data Thief, um, who basically was recovering data of Blackness, right, from various institutions and entities. In many ways, it is a precursor to the ways that we understand sampling practices within hip hop. Uh, and I want to show a short clip from the trailer to give you a sense of part of what a conference was trying to talk about in The Last Angel in History. We came across the story of a blues man from the 1930s, a guy called Robert Johnson. Now the story goes that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads in the deep south. He sold his soul, and in return, he was given the secret of a black technology, a black secret technology that we know to be now as the blues. The blues begat jazz, the blues begat soul, the blues begat hip hop, the blues begat R&B. Now, flash forward 200 years into the future. Next figure, another hoodlum, another bad boy scavenger poet figure. He's called a data thief. 200 years into the future, the data thief has told a story. If you can find the crossroads, a crossroads, this crossroads, if you can make an archeological dig into this crossroads, you'll find fragments, techno fossils. And if you can put those elements, those fragments together, you'll find the code. Crack that code and you'll have the keys to your future. You've got one clue and it's a phrase, mothership connection. I love what a conference does there because I would argue that the fundamental political work of blackness in the digital era is in fact these, this recovery of these fragments of data that connect us to a larger trajectory of blackness, right? And creates a connection between where we are now and an Afrofuturistic future, if you will. Handheld technology becomes such a critical aspect of this, right? And it's so interesting, again, thinking about a confer, thinking about a dated thief in the early 1990s, right? Before existing technologies for handheld devices um, even occurred. And so I always go back to Craig Watkinson's work, The Young and the Digital, which now is almost a decade old, where he talks about social and mobile media platforms have emerged as the dominant technologies in young people's lives. They have not known a world without computers and software capable of handling multiple tasks at the same time. From their view of the world, the computer has always been what one research group calls a multitasking hub. 
they've come to think of the world, and this is from Gardner and Davis from their book, The App Generation. They've come to think of the world as an ensemble of apps, or perhaps in many cases, a single or stated cradle to grave app. And if no app can be imagined or devised, then the desire simply does not matter. And what that has meant for us, both in terms of doing the work of social justice and in the particular context of this talk today, doing the work of Black studies, is having to reimagine the work that we do within the context of the technology that exists. When I talk about this concept of aggregating Blackness, right, forever the ghost in the machine or perhaps fugitives in the machine, as historian Jessica Marie Johnson might be apt to describe, the Black digital responses to said machine has been in the curation of digital Blackness, the digital archive as maroon, the building of digital platforms, the construction of symbolic Black literacies or hashtags, the privileging of back channeling in concert with the undercommoning of the university and the state, and then in the aggregation of Blackness, where aggregation functions as the ethical embodiment of Black collectivity. When I think about the work that's being done in the digital public, Black digital public at this moment, I think of a magazine like Black Perspectives, right? Which is the, the magazine associated with the African-American um, Institute of Historical Studies. I intellectual, I, can't, I didn't quite get that right, but we call it AHIS. And for the last three years, they've been publishing history into the mainstream, into the digital commons, right, in ways that are accessible and friendly. I think about the early week now work going back now a decade of the Crunk Feminist Collective, right, of which most famously, Brittany Cooper was one of the founders, doing critical work to bring to bear a critique from Black feminist thought in the context of what was happening in the digital sphere. I think about the work that's being currently done by Site Black Women, right? Which is a collective of Black women, many of them in archeology span and anthropology, right? Who have been doing the politics of making sure that there is a citation politic around the work that Black women are doing that functions both as a group and a site that's producing conversations with Black women scholars, but also serves as a hashtag, as a reminder of the practice of citation as it relates to the lives and experiences and obviously the intellectual production of Black women. For me, that question of Black studies in the digital era has been in the context of the work that I've done now for 11 years. Uh, it's amazing to think of the fact that we're in the 11th season of Left to Black, um, but doing work that brought people into conversation to make Black studies accessible to a broader public. My inspirations for creating Left to Black were many fold. Uh, I think specifically about the fact that as a young Black intellectual in the 1990s who wanted to be a public intellectual, my goal always was to appear on the Charlie Rose show. Um, and I always hoped that would happen when I came to Duke because Charlie Rose was a, a Duke graduate, Duke alum. But when I realized that I was not going to get invited on the Charlie Rose show, I decided to create my own version of the Charlie Rose show and left the black. I also wanted to capture the looseness um, and the camaraderie of what I've always experienced now for more than 50 years of my life of being in a black barber shop, right? And also other black social spaces. You know, I grew up in my earliest years uh, around an aunt who owned a beauty parlor. And, you know, and so for the test, first 10 years of my life, I spent a lot of time surrounded by Black women of all hues, of all colors, of, of all shades, of all hairstyles. Um, and I wanted to and left the Black to create that kind of communal aspect in talking about Black intellectual life. And I do want to show just a couple of clips. One is this promo that we did for Left to Black. Um, in its second season, um, that gives you a kind of sense of what we have been trying to achieve, you know, over these years. What is left of black? Rhythm and Damn. creative spirit. Black feminist film. Education. Politics. Curating the black intellectual black tradition. Public. Left of black is left of black. I feel like um, most people recognize importance to a lot of the artists in my collection these days, but mm -hmm. when I started back uh, in the mid 90s, mm -hmm. it was very out of fashion to be collecting uh, identity art. Learning the song after I feel that spark is, is, is also about learning the spark. Like what is it that grabbed me about the song? And sometimes I want to see on the screen uh, the people I know and recognize mm -hmm. and love.
If you're a young snake person, you're coming to Mississippi, they had to depend upon a local community to eat, to get transportation, but also for protection. And I think that's what's been left out of the narrative. And I tell a story in the conclusion of my book. I come to Atlanta for a meeting of the National Black Student Association. And one of the elders, Dara Bubakari, and Walter, her son, they uh, allowed me to ride back to New Orleans after the meeting. And as we went through Birmingham, they started to tell all these stories about black folk defending people who were involved in nonviolent demonstrations, black people being on the sidelines with guns to be there in case things got out of hand particularly with, with the Klan, not necessarily with the police, because I think the thing with the police was supposed to play out so it could be documented and exposed the nature of racism. And they also mentioned guns being buried in the country, and that's where black people would sometimes store their weapons and, and also ammunition in case they needed them at a different time. I also tell another story, Janie Brewer, who's a grandmother, 86 years old, has a family, and they kind of live in this compound. And when Snick folk used to organize people to go down to the courthouse and go vote or attempt to register to vote, Night Riders attacked that compound and then harass the folks. So Mrs. Brewer comes up with this strategy. The next time they go, when white invaders come back, the road is lined up with black folks with guns. Her grandchildren and children, along with the nonviolent Snick folk, are in the cotton fields prepared to ambush them. And all along, she's inside the house making a Molotov cocktail, making several Molotov cocktails. <laughs> so when the Night Riders, led by the sheriff, come, a floodlight is flashed on the invaders. The people come out to ambush them, and then she comes out with her Molotov cocktail. I just wish I had a photograph of that. <laughs> uh, but what it does say to me is there was a certain type of culture, a certain type of awareness, certain segments of our community had to be able to try to protect people who are out trying to guarantee them the right to vote and to guarantee their other human rights, but also to protect the community as a whole. You know, there's a history going back to the first Africans who were brought here, particularly when you have slave codes, to try to disarm black people. At the same time, in the United States, there's been a tradition of a frontier mentality to be armed. And being armed, to some degree, is associated with citizenship, which is why I think our ancestors, after becoming emancipated, wanted to have the right to bear arms. I wanted to show this second clip. We began the project around three years ago. Um, one of the motivations and, and mindsets behind Left to Black was that we would build something that was had an evergreen quality to it. So we've never done you know, things that we might think of as timely news stories, right? We always built stuff in the practice of doing Left to Black that would have resonances in an archive well after the time in which we produced a, a particular episode. And we realized a few years ago that we had at the time eight or nine years of this archive. And what we decided to do was to repurpose the archive. And so what we did was to go in and pull certain themes from the archive. This particular one was on armed resistance, pulled the audio from those actual interviews and then create new images, animation in some cases to tell a different kind of story. And most importantly, this was our attempt to create, to use, to utilize the Left of Black archive to begin to build a curriculum for K through 12, right? And we built this project out through a, a test pro project with four episodes where we created these four modulars, right? Based on these certain kind of themes, um, teaching guides for teachers who were interested in teaching these guides. Um, and then of course, creating these small video clips that would be attractive, you know, to K through 12 audiences. And this is what I mean when I say the politics can't simply just be the content. Social justice can't simply be the content of what we're doing in the digital realm. It also has to be embodied in the practice of doing this work. When I think about doing Black studies in this particular moment, responding to the impulse and inclination by those with the resources to dig data deeply and mind Blackness, there have been moves within what might be called, but not compellingly so, digital Black studies or Black digital studies or a nascent Black code studies that resist the ordering of things. A Black studies that relishes in its messiness, what historian Jessica Marie Johnson calls Black ephemera or the flotsam and jetsam of Blackness, as if Blackness itself might not be that ephemera or what Manthea Diawara once called Afro-kitsch, 
concretely the response to the so-called digital of black studies has been in the curation of blackness, the building of digital platforms, the construction of symbolic black literacies, hashtags, as I said earlier, and the privileging of black, cha black back channeling. And then it is aggregation, where aggregation functions as the ethical embodiment of black shareability, the impulse, or per Henry Jenkins, black spreadability as an impact and practice. And in terms of thinking about this nascent field called Black Code Studies, the work that I've done with historian Jessica Marie Johnson, co-teaching undergraduate and graduate courses from both Duke and John Hopkins, creating a mixtape that was connected to these classes to eventually co-editing an issue of Black Scholar, of the Black Scholar in the fall of 2017, based on the idea of Black Code Studies featuring original art by John Jennings. And I'll just leave with this quote um, from uh, our essay that opens that particular issue. Black Code Studies is queer, femme, fugitive, and radical. As praxis and methodology, it waxes insurgent. It refutes conceptions of the digital that remove Black diasporic people from engagement with technology, modernity, or the future. It centers Black thought and cultural production across a range of digital platforms, but especially social media, where Black freedom struggles intersect with Black play and death and polymorphic and polyphonic intimacy. Black Code Studies roots itself in the challenge of living in the wake of Black people, rendered inhuman, not existent, and disposal by the slave ship, the plantation, the colonial state, the prison, the border. Facing devastation again and again, Black folks need in and for each other becomes both time-traveling desire and reservoir of knowledge. As gum shows, as in Alexis Pauline gums, our oracle work seeps up and through tools, structures, analog, and digital architecture we were never meant to survive, much less occupy. Thank you very much for your time and attention uh, this afternoon. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Kendall Phillips, a professor of communication and rhetorical studies and the other co-director of the Lender <laughs> Center, along with Marcel. And so I want to begin by saying uh, a deep gratitude to Dr. Neal. Thank you so much uh, for being here, for bringing your work. We're honored to have you even virtually on our campus. And as part of this collaborative effort to explore these complex relationships between social justice, history, memory, race, social media. The Lender Center is, is designed to be a collaborative space, one that harnesses the power of interdisciplinary research and conversations to explore the complex relationships around issues of social justice. Uh, and here I wanna take a pause to acknowledge the often unseen collaborators who make events like this possible, our friends from tech support like Andrew and the great staff in the School of Education like Carly and Allison, the world's hardest working graduate assistant, Evan. Uh, and here I also wanna just add uh, on a personal note, how deeply indebted I am uh, to Dr. Marcel Haddix, uh, my main collaborator over the past four years during which the center has developed built and launched. Uh, I'm in awe of Dr. Haddix's intellect, her values, her commitment to social justice, and honored to have served alongside her during this difficult, complex, and ultimately very rewarding experience. Ultimately, all of our efforts have been focused on building a space on Syracuse University's campus where we could support the outstanding work of our faculty, and we're honored to have reached the conclusion of our inaugural Lender Faculty Fellows Project the Social Justice Hashtag Project led by Dr. Kazare Abdul Ghani. Dr. Abdul Ghani holds a PhD in English from Purdue University, where she concentrated in African-American studies. Dr. Abdul Ghani's work focuses on popular culture, protest, and digital humanities, and she has published numerous essays on the politics of protest and revolt, the Black arts movement, and social media. She is currently an assistant professor of African-American studies here at Syracuse University, and over the past two years, she has led an incredible group of students in a study of social justice messages within the sphere of social media. I am pleased to turn the floor over and introduce to you our inaugural Lender Faculty Fellow, Dr. Kazare Abdul Ghani. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank Chancellor Serverud, co-directors of the Linder Center 
Dr. Kendall Phillips and Dr. Marcel Haddix and founders Marvin and Helene Linder. Also, I want to specially thank Dr. Amber Johnson, computer scientist for her expertise and webmaster design, and Ms. Jasmine Morris, graphic designer for creating our logos and visuals for this digital humanities presentation. Welcome to my meeting room. The Social Justice Hashtag Project is a digital humanities study examining viral hashtags on Instagram and Twitter that reveal the confluence between activism and social media. The goal is to illuminate and push forward academic pedagogy that centers social media as a rigorous form of study within humanities disciplines to analyze how student fellows interrogate viral hashtags that uncover the authentic, inauthentic, tangential, and vibrant ways digital messaging connects with modern day practices of protests and social activism that move beyond traditional forms of communication such as analog and printed media. And finally, spotlight student research and contextualize a myriad of hashtags that center social justice causes. Now, as a refresher, social media is a form of communication or visual media that allows speech and expression to be communicated in code, characters, and images. Our student fellows research centers to social media platforms, Instagram and Twitter. Twitter is a text-based messaging application that allows users to write in 140 characters, insightful, profound, and sometimes outlandish information that reaches millions of people. Instagram is a pictorial mobile application that works best as a visual collage representing individual and group activity. Now what makes both Instagram and Twitter unique are the computational signs act and hashtag which concentrate information through algorithms that filter topics and coordinate conversations, making them trending topics or as we call it going viral. The asset that Instagram and Twitter thrive on is the hashtag. According to scholar Andre Brock, the hashtag is, quote, cultural digital practice, end quote, that builds social affinities among users. The hashtags that student fellows investigate are part of social and cultural informational identity that centers social justice activism and makes appropriate that call for critical interventional intervention about topics such as racism, gender bias, and sexual assault that are often understood as inappropriate conversation. Since the fall of 2019, inaugural Linder Center for Social Justice student fellows, Abigail Tick, Andrea Constant, Grace Ash, and Adriana Lobo interrogate how Instagram and Twitter is effective in creating a culturally neutral space that produces narratives that advance social justice causes that have an undeniable impact on its followers. The selected hashtags are hashtag why I didn't report, which examines rape and sexual assault, hashtag say her name, which examines gender-based state violence against Black women, femmes, and girls in the United States. Hashtag Oscar so white, which examines the lack of racial diversity in the Academy Awards. And Ni Una Mas, which examines Latinx gender-based state violence in Mexico and Latin America. As faculty fellow, I assigned student fellows with a set of questions to answer as they formulate their own research questions that propel their qualitative and quantitative analysis, you will see shortly. These questions are one, what makes Instagram and Twitter impactful social media spaces for social justice awareness? 
Two, how did the social justice viral messaging on Instagram and Twitter lead to critical discussions that present effective spaces for reform? And three, what effective aims can push a national or international conversation about social justice causes to fit a diverse and inclusive framework for all to understand? Methodologically, we utilize the digital humanities, a field that has been in existence since the 1980s, which encompasses the marriage between computer science methods and software with traditional humanities-based research and methods. The social justice hashtag project utilizes computer software, Tableau Public, and Twitter Archive and Google Strip, also, also known as tags, and Tweet Archiver, powered by Google Chrome to collect over 100,000 viral text messages on Instagram and Twitter through four unique hashtags that I previously mentioned. Through qualitative analysis, student fellows will share today their data and visualizations concerning trending social justice movements on social media. Such data visualizations help to concretize trending social justice movements on social media. In alignment with Syracuse University's core values of ethics and merit, all names and other confidential information of a social media user's identity is removed. For our project, we only use themes such as geography, gender, race, and data such as statistics to support our research. Moreover, the social justice hashtag project does not interrogate how bad actors abuse social media. That research is important and speaks to the ethical matters of net neutrality and violation of public trust on matters related to surveillance and policing on the internet, a concern that scholar Rua Benjamin argues is the quote, new Jim Code, the employment of new technologies that reflect and reproduce existing inequities, but that are promoted and perceived as more objective or progressive than the discriminatory systems of a previous era, end quote. Therefore, our project's aim is to interrogate thematic hashtags trending on Instagram and Twitter that exposes bias conveyed among human rights organizations, individuals, and in the political sphere. So I want to thank you for joining me in my virtual meeting room this afternoon to provide an overview of the social justice hashtag project. Without further ado, I present to you all our inaugural Linder Center for Social Justice Student Fellows in the order of what you see on your screen. Abigail Tick, a junior majoring in sociology, citizenship, and civic engagement in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Andrea Constant, a graduate student in the Department of Sociology at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Grace Ash, a senior television, radio, and film major at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications and a African American Studies minor in the College of Arts and Sciences. And Adriana Lobo, a junior communication and rhetorical studies major in the College of Visual and Performing Arts and Policy Studies major. So Abigail, take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Abigail Georgia Tick and I am so excited to be a member of the inaugural class of student fellows for the Linder Center for Social Justice. I am a junior pursuing three majors, sociology, citizenship and civic engagement and women's and gender studies within the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and the College of Arts and Sciences at Syracuse University. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to present to you my contribution to the social justice hashtag project, hashtag why I didn't report, a virtual space for testimony for survivors of sexual violence. I do want to provide a content warning for themes of sexual assault, violence, and rape. 
I ask that each of you please practice radical self-care, and I understand that for some, that may mean respectfully leaving this space. Thank you. Now, for a little background. When tasked to choose the hashtag movement I would be working with for two years, why I didn't report was the obvious choice. My second week on campus as a freshman at Syracuse University, I participated in a walkout against Justice Brett Kavanaugh during his US Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Our goal as organizers was to show survivors of sexual violence in both our campus and national communities that we believed them. These few days spent on the quad with megaphones and posters surrounded by aspiring change makers sparked a passion for social justice that I have carried with me every day. I knew I wanted to honor the moment that helped me find my voice as an advocate and continue to commit myself to supporting and empowering survivors of sexual violence. It has been an honor to work with hashtag why didn't report and the thousands of individuals whose tweets and stories I read, sobbed and celebrated too. I would like to dedicate this project and this opportunity to share my work with all of you here today to the brave survivors who found their community in this movement. As you might have guessed from my introduction, the origin of the hashtag movement, Why Didn't it Report, is linked to the controversial appointment of Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court by President Donald Trump. In the summer of 2018, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford wrote an anonymous confidential letter to senior Democratic lawmakers alleging that Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her more than three years ago when they were high school students. While the letter was leaked to the public, Dr. Ford's name remained anonymous. In a statement released by the White House, Brett Kavanaugh responded, I categorically and unequivocally deny this allegation. I did not do this back in high school or at any time. Dr. Ford made the courageous decision to come forward and reveal her identity as the survivor from the letter in the Washington Post. This article that detailed Dr. Ford's narrative serves as a time capsule of archiving this historical moment. It was referred to both in Dr. Ford's opening statement at the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings and is also known as the article that prompted the infamous Twitter response by President Donald Trump. On September 21st, 2018, President Trump tweeted, I have no doubt that if the attack on Dr. Ford was as bad as she says, charges would have been immediately filed with local law enforcement authorities by either her or her loving parents. I ask that she bring those filings forward so that we can learn date, time, and place. Survivors of abuse responded by rallying around a new hashtag, why I didn't report, to highlight the difficulties, fear, anger, and shame that so often surround sexual harassment and assault. J.C. Fortin, an investigative journalist for the New York Times, had the opportunity to interview survivors who used the hashtag during its initial week of existence. Fortin gathered that hashtag why I didn't report serves as a tool to answer the question often posed on victims of sexual violence. Why didn't you say something sooner? This project explores how virtual testimony expressed within the margins of space created by the hashtag movement why I didn't report contributes both to survivor healing and social justice. I define testimony as a deeply personal narrative that according to Sylvia Pelliser Orton is told by one survivor to another that is both cathartic and unifying. unifying. Space is the bounds in which survivors of sexual assault can discuss their experience, control their narrative and receive affirmation. I collected tweets containing the hashtag why didn't it report using a Twitter archiver add-on for Google Sheets from April to August of 2020. I initially collected around 6,200 tweets, but after months of data cleaning and reading through each individual entry, I found myself with a final collection of 1,918 tweets that serve as my survivor network that I present to you today. My decisions to omit certain entries was determined both by if their geographical location was found outside the United States and tweets that although contained the hashtag did not have the necessary intent of sharing a survivor testimony that I was interested in documenting for this project. 
Tweets were collected from 46 of the 50 states. And this visualization illustrates how widespread the hashtag was being used in 2020, which is two years after it was initially introduced on Twitter. Survivors are continuing to use hashtag why didn't report as a platform for testimony across the country in high rates. By hand, I organized and annotated the tweets into categories of reasons why the users claim to have not reported their experience of sexual assault. This was done by initially reading through the data inputs over and over again. I would record key themes and patterns that I noticed among the narratives being captured in the tweets. I then uploaded the data inputs into a word frequency generator and found that there were crossovers with the language and phrases that the computer found with the themes I had noticed in my analysis. I organized the data into the following seven categories in order of their frequency. Fear, lack of belief, self-blame or guilt, partner or friend, family member, age, and intoxication as the reasons behind why the survivor did not report their assault. While the distribution across the categories of reasons for not reporting is, as you can see, relatively comparable, the three that were associated with the highest volume of tweets were fear, lack of belief, and self-blame. When comparing these three categories to the other four, there is a stark thematic difference. The categories partner, friend, and family are representative of interpersonal relationships, making the survivor feel powerless or unable to report. Age and intoxication are palpable environmental forces that are unchangeable and they hamper the agency of an individual. I want you to take a moment to ask yourself, what do victims of sexual violence look like? There are widespread attitudes and beliefs about sexual assault that actively work to deny and justify violent behavior while stigmatizing the survivor. The dialogue surrounding sexual violence consistently involves victim blaming, disbelief of the claims of rape or assault, exonerating the perpetrator, and creating a stereotypical image of what a rape victim looks like. What makes fear, lack of belief, and self-blame stand out is that they are all internalized emotional expressions constructed by external societal forces. When interpersonal violence, victimization, and the need to heal are stigmatized within mainstream American culture, the act of publicly identifying as a survivor can be stigmatizing in and of itself. Using the hashtag works to diminish some of the stigmas because there is a protection in the collective unity of survivors. Survivors can defend and support each other without the constraints of geographical or interpersonal divides. According to a study done on rape culture and social media, autobiographical statements include the presentation of private thoughts to a public setting and work to create a bond of intimacy with an imagined audience while simultaneously affirming the authenticity of the survivor's experience. The survivor testimony is received, authenticated, and reciprocated within the, bonds, within the bounds of the hashtag why I didn't report. Using buoyant software to text mine allowed for the collective identity of the survivor network captured by the data to come alive visually. I created this word cloud from the data collection to see specifically what language the survivors were engaging with. There were over 60 tags that revealed a frequency of words that 10 or more users tweeted. The 15 with the highest frequency were he, belief, told, family, scared, relationship, fault, young, love, drunk, boyfriend, blame, she, police, shame. At least 80 survivors had to use the word for it to appear in this cloud. As you can see, hashtag why didn't report creates a tangible survivor network um, that transforms private experiences into public discourse. When a survivor enters Twitter and clicks on the hashtag why didn't report, they are met with a mass of tweets by people who also have experienced sexual violence, who also made the active decision to not report, and who also turned to this hashtag to find community and perhaps a space for their own testimony. But the beauty of this movement is that even if a survivor does not want to tweet their testimony, they can still be a part of the community by reading and engaging with the testimonies made by others. This process can be highly cathartic. 
So what makes hashtag why didn't report different from offline spaces dedicated to centering survivors? Lauren Burgoon, a researcher in survivor trauma reports, the ready access and anonymity of the internet can help sexual assault victims take the first step toward becoming survivors. Disclosing online can help people not yet ready to tell family or friends about the sexual assault. It can ease the pain of people who don't believe or act support, supportive of survivors. Users can create anonymous accounts unaffiliated with their legal names and still engage with the hashtag why didn't report movement. I found this occurrence during my initial data cleaning. Many accounts were unaffiliated with geophysical locations, the typical format of a first and last name, and their account bio lacked identifying information. Hashtag why I didn't report also presents itself as a unique space for survivor testimony, unlike those that exist offline, because a user does not have to be a survivor themselves to enter the space. Seeing a survivor's story in 280 characters or less situated between seemingly mundane tweets demands attention and occupies space without the permission of those who interact with it. It works as a tool for social justice as it appears in a non-traditional space where non-survivors are forced to engage with survivor testimony, perhaps for the first time. Using hashtag why I didn't report is a restorative process that turns the passive victim into the active survivor. According to Randall Morris, a researcher in testimonial forms and social justice, the ability to give testimony and have it heard, considered, circulated, and acted upon is fundamental to social justice. It also gives the survivor complete control over how they want to tell their story, what details to share, and keeping in mind that the most important part of the story may very well remain untold. The survivor testimony is framed entirely by the survivor without the influences of the offline world where the violence occurred. This form of testimony creates space for social discourse and allows marginalized people to communicate in a self-organized way. Hashtag why didn't report is a movement created by survivors for survivors. When survivors document their experiences using the hashtag and publicize a formerly private experience, it is an act of social justice framed through the feminist paradigm, the personal is political. Hashtag why I didn't report has signaled an evolution in the response to sexual violence by creating a virtual culture and community through the construction of an unprecedented space for survivor testimony. The practice of testimony using hashtag why I didn't report seems inherently unpolitical due to its lack of legal or formal consequences. However, according to ZZ Papakrissi, a researcher in technology politics, public sharing like this works effectively to understand humans as collective and emotional. This is particularly useful in understanding politics within digital cultures, as it does not conform to the structures we symbolically internalize as political, such as conventional modes of protest activism. There is, power in in, there is power in intentionally sharing what is socially constructed as private in the public sphere. This movement is an attempt to connect the private to the public and the personal to the civic. Why I didn't report also serves to archive the renderings of survivor storytelling through the process of digitization. By the nature of it being a hashtag movement, why I didn't report creates a tangible network of survivors by attaching narratives to one another, resulting in a preserved digital community. The context of the hashtag allows for the assumption that the survivor did not report their experience, and many tweets in the data set contained language implying that when tweeting their testimony, it was the first time the survivor had discussed the details of their assault. Why I didn't report works to eradicate silencing mechanisms often associated with victimization and promotes survivor healing by fostering a unique testimonial space that enables communicative freedom or the ability to speak one's truth into existence. It enables survivors to legitimize their experience by documenting their narrative in a virtual space that both acknowledges and affirms it and also works to disrupt spaces not traditionally occupied by narratives of sexual violence. It pushes private experiences into public discourse. Hashtag why didn't it report is an unprecedented space for testimony because the survivor whose agency was at one time diminished can now take control of their narrative 
and even plays a role in transformative justice in the process. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for supporting our symposium at this time. My name is Andrea Constant, and I am a second year PhD student in the sociology department here at Syracuse University. My research examines Black and Latinx women and girls and their realities within the intersections of education, punishment, and the practice of refusal. I'm excited to share my project, Say Her Name, utilizing Twitter to resist the invisibility of gender-based state violence with you all. Before beginning my presentation, I want to preface this presentation with a trigger warning. The following presentation centers the experiences of Black women, femmes, and girls, and their families who have suffered the traumatic, fatal realities of the carceral state. Specifically, this presentation involves a critical conversation about police violence, death, and injustice. Photos of victims and their families and loved ones will be shown. If you begin to feel uncomfortable, please take the steps you need to do to comfort yourself, even if this means pausing your viewership of the presentation. The numbers seven and 92 have an array of meetings. However, at this moment, seven and 92 and those in between represent a significant loss. Ayanna Saley Jones was only seven years old when she was shot and killed by police in Detroit, Michigan on May 16, 2010, asleep in her home on her couch. Ayana's grandmother witnessed her death marked by her blanket being caught on fire from a thrown grenade and a gunshot wound. While filming an episode of the first 48, police raided their home in hopes of finding a murder suspect, but instead captured Ayana's death on film. Katherine Johnson, was a 92-year-old woman from Atlanta, Georgia, killed by police after a botched drug raid and no-knock warrant in her home on November 21st, 2006. Not only were both of their lives ended traumatically, but their humanness was also continuously invali invalidated and by falsified evidence and counter stories of the events and reasons for their deaths. Since 2015, recorded by the Fatal Force database made available by the Washington Post, 6,060 individuals have been killed by police. Social movements such as Black Lives Matter, originating in 2013 by founders Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, have the, after the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who was responsible for the death of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, was established as a direct call to action to confront white supremacy, especially in the form of police and vigilante violence. However, as the movement and the hashtag Black Lives Matter gained public attention and traction, the framing of the movement depicted police and vigilante violence as a problem centering the experiences of Black, cisgender, and heterosexual men. This presentation does not serve as a space to discount the gender specific experiences of Black men. However, I aim to address the voices within the margins, Black women, femmes, and girls. To understand the breadths of police violence, it is necessary to bring forth and situate the gender specific experiences of Black women, femmes, and girls. To center the experiences of Black women, femmes, and girls, the African American Policy Forum, led by Executive Director, Legal Scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, and the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, established the Say Her Name campaign in 2014. Strategically, the African American Policy Forum and Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies situates the racialized and gender specific ways in which black women, femmes and girls experience police violence. By no mistake can we mistake the Say Her Name campaign as a separate movement from Black Lives Matter. However, Say Her Name provides a call within the house for the recognition of marginalized racial and gendered experiences of black women, femmes and girls. In the words of the African American Policy, Policy Forum, the objective of the campaign is to quote, bring awareness to the often invisible names and stories of black women and girls who have been victimized by racist police violence and provides support to their families, end quote. 
The Say Her Name campaign is responsible for organizing families of women, femmes, and girls killed by police, specifically aiding in the resources and organizing public vigils, lobbying lawmakers centering police reformation efforts, and focusing on the individualized needs of the surviving families of victims. Bridging and demanding attention, organizing and justice are three elements of this campaign. In 2015, the African American Policy Forum and attorney Andrea Ritchie released a report titled Say Her Name, Resisting Police Violence Against Black Women to not only speak of the ways in which Black women are subjected to police violence, but also how their stories of their killings have lacked attention and accountability within the media and representations of police violence in America. Along with the report, the African American Policy Forum first tweeted the hashtag Say Her Name on May 13, 2015, to announce a vigil that was to be held in Union Square South in New York City. The year 2015 also marks the year in which Sandra Bland was pulled over in Wall Waller County, Texas for a traffic violation, arrested and found dead in her holding cell days later on July 13th. Sandra Bland's death sparked a utilization of the hashtag Say Her Name on Twitter, which at which also as scholars Jennifer Borda and Bailey Marshall stated, quote, sparked a national conversation about police brutality against black women, an issue rarely discussed in public discourse at that time, end quote. To address the breadth of police violence and its effects on black communities, we must garner an understanding and proper advocacy for all who experience and are impacted by state violence. With the lack of attention towards the killings of black women, femmes and girls, from police violence, say her name as a campaign and social media hashtag seek to address the question, what does it mean for black women, femmes and girls to not be able to be safe, heard or fought for? Before moving forward, it is imperative to briefly discuss how police violence affects black women, femmes and girls. As we know, fatal force is typically used towards individuals who are posed as threats to police officers, armed and unarmed. Black women, femmes, and girls deaths in the hands of police are painted to be solely in private spaces such as their homes as for Ayanna Jones and Katherine Johnston. However, when situating the breadth of police violence, we need to hold equal space for the realities of violence in public spaces such as schools as pictured by the image on the left and as pictured on the right, a teenage pool party. Not pictured are the experiences of black women, femmes, and girls who experience sexual assault at the hands of the state. In her book, Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color, attorney Andrea Ritchie details various stories and how sexual assault is perpetrated by law enforcement officials, especially targeting those who identify as trans, queer, and lesbian. To bring Andrea Ritchie's findings home, two incidents in Syracuse were mentioned in the book, focusing on the targeting of a Black girl in public school district here in Syracuse, and a former police officer who went to trial for sexually assaulting women of color. For these individuals, we cry, say her name, to center the experiences against the actions of forgetful forgetfulness of their lives, pain, and grief from loved ones in their communities. My project's contribution introduces a critical conversation about the utilization of the hashtag say her name on Twitter. While introduced in 2014 as a campaign and implemented in 2015 as a social media hashtag, my presentation solely focuses on the hashtag's usage in 2020 and how it garnered traction in response to Breonna Taylor's murder during this period of state-sanctioned violence. I also aim to explain how my data collection, with how during my data collection, the hashtag was stagnant in speaking to and about police violence against black women, girls, and femmes, introducing concerns for other racialized and gendered inequalities. Methodologically, I utilize Tweet Archiver, an extension provided by Google Chrome, operative within Google Sheets, to collect approximately 51,695 tweets from April 29th to July 26, 2020. The individual text archived from individual tweets, location data, depending on availability and validity, and retweets and likes equated to engagement are three of the many columns of data made accessible by such extension. For this project's purposes, I solely utilize location and tweet text data since I aim to situate the dialogue associated with the hashtag and the geographical locations in which tweets were sent. 
If locations were not present or could not be confirmed, such data was only utilized to analyze the specificity of say her name's usage. I, su I suspect the lack of Twitter users confirming and including their location is due to privacy. Visualizations for this project were created through the data visualization program, Tableau Public. Once evaluated, the collected tweets displayed three critical themes. Until the murder of 26-year-old Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, gained traction on Twitter, say her name addressed various racialized and gendered inequalities affecting women, femmes, and girls. 45,798 of the tweets I gathered appearing onward from May 8th focused primarily on Breonna Taylor's murder, changing discourse and the hashtag's usage. Second, during the mass mobilizations during the summer of 2020, due to the murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd in the hands of the police, cities within the United States with rich histories of collective action against state sanctioned violence served as hubs of mass tweeting attaching Say Her Name. Third, it is essential to note that Say Her Name attained a globalized response with various countries participating in the hashtag's usage. As displayed, Say Her Name has been utilized to discuss a spectrum of societal ills rooted in injustice, ranging from healthcare access, sexual assault, and broader conversations around femicide. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated humans globally, specifically in the United States communities of color. From my observations, tweets encompassing the government's negligence and its impact on women within the healthcare industry, along with the exacerbated inequalities that incarcerated persons, in this case, women, caused a utilization of Say Her Name to highlight the realities of the pandemic. Tweets encompassing allegations of sexual assault by prior President Donald Trump and current President Joe Biden were also amplified. My data also display users dedicating the usage of Say Her Name hashtag to highlight cis and trans women's experiences with intimate partner violence and femicide, which is the gender-based targeted killing of women, femmes, and girls rooted in patriarchy and heteronormativity. As mentioned earlier, on May 8, 2020, tweets centered on Breonna Taylor's death began to take hold on Twitter. Breonna Taylor was a 26-year-old EMT whose killing is marked as collateral damage. Taylor was accompanied within her apartment with her partner whose story of the events counter the police's argument of knocking and announcing their presence for a planned narcotics investigation. Today, only one officer involved in the raid of Breonna Taylor's death has been charged and fired from the LMPD with charges related to endangering surrounding neighbors, not Breonna's death. As shown by the graphic, I was able to quantify how many tweets called for the immediate justice of for Breonna Taylor, including the popularized phrase, arrest the cops who killed Breonna Taylor. In summary, individuals not only use this hashtag to bring attention to Breonna Taylor's murder, but also utilize the space to demand her murder's acknowledgement by the criminal justice system. As 86% of my data centers Breonna Taylor, the rest of my presentation considers the geographic impact of her death domestically and globally. By utilizing pursued location data from Twitter users, I depicted which cities within the United States produced significant quantities of tweets related to Breonna Taylor's death. As displayed by the graphic, Los Angeles, New York City, Chicago, Washington DC, Louisville, Atlanta, and Philadelphia were the most active cities in which Say Her Name tweets focused on Breonna Taylor. It is important to highlight such cities because of mass mobilization taken to the streets in such cities over the past summer and their legacies in organizing against state sanctioned violence. When specifically focusing on Louisville, Kentucky, it is imperative to view the city as a site of resistance historically. Louisville was the first Southern city to administer local civil rights and fair housing legislation and desegregating schools. Even with this historic feat, Louisville as displayed by the fallout of Breonna Taylor's murder, community organizers are still fighting for equality and reformation of law enforcement and accountability for law enforcement's latch to impunity. One aspect of my research which personally shocked me was the global reach of Say Her Name. The countries highlighted in red display locations I was able to decipher within my data contributing to Say Her Name, not only grasping global attention, but also highlighting police and vigilante violence and femicide as an experience for women around the globe, specifically women of the African diaspora. These findings lead to an interference 
into an inference rooted in proposed global solidarity and commitment to addressing the global and nation specific injustices and addressing gender based state violence, especially for black women, femmes and girls. In conclusion, Say Her Name as a global movement seeks to address overarching themes of anti-Black, patriarchal, and heteronormative violence administered by state actors, such as police and non-state actors within communities. Say Her Name was strategically created as a campaign and social media hashtag that centers Black women, femmes, and girls who are rele relegated to the margins of conversations of police violence, ignoring their racialized and gender-specific experiences. However, it is imperative to situate the ways in which the hashtag was used prior to Breonna Taylor's murder during my data collection, resulting in Say Her Name evolving into a space speaking out against racialized and gendered inequality and violence in other areas, such as the effects of COVID-19 and the globalized experiences of femicide. In this moment, Say Her Name is garnering attention from corner to corner of the globe, initiating promise for transnational solidarity for Say Her Name as an active space digitally for advocacy and organizing along with the continuation of on the ground action to continue to move the experiences of black women, femmes and girls with police violence from margin to center but also expanding to addressing anti-Black and gendered injustice to women of the African diaspora globally. My research aims to uncover how Say Her Name is currently utilized in addressing police and vigilante violence against Black women, girls, and femmes. It is with the hope that these individuals and their experiences will be centered in conversations of police violence moving forward. We will continue to say her name loudly and without apology to continue to uncover the global realities of Black women, femmes, and girls to counter white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. As we see the number seven and 92 again in closing, I would like to take the time to highlight the names and ages of others in spirit of say her name. This does not constitute an exhaustive list. Miriam Carey, 34. Corn Gaines, 23. Deborah Danner, 66. Darenisha Clay, 17. Luana Phillips, 36. Pamela Turner, 45. Taisha Miller, 19. And Atiana Jefferson, 28. Remember her name, learn her story, share her story, and importantly, say her name. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Grace Ash and um, I am one of the inaugural student fellows for the Lender Center for Social Justice um, Digital Humanities Project. Um, for my contribution, I studied the hashtag, hashtag Oscar so white um, in order to identify how Hollywood has and hasn't diversified film. Um, this is relevant because for many reasons, but primarily because I am a television, radio and film major as well as an African-American studies minor. So how did this hashtag come about? The 2015 Oscar nomination ceremony demonstrated the epitome of modern racial exclusion when not a single black person was nominated in the best actor or best actress categories in a year of great non-white films. In a wave of sarcasm, April Rain tweeted, hashtag Oscars so white, they asked to touch my hair. When the 2016 award ceremony presented the same exact problem, the hashtag went viral. The goal of this research is to do two things. Primarily is to identify whether or not hashtag Oscar so white has made an impact on the film industry, specifically in the realm of filmmakers. It is also our goal to explain the importance of increased inclusion in the filmmaking industry through filmmaking and the roles that filmmakers play in diversifying film and our representative culture. The methods I used to present the data that you will see shortly um, were first, I gathered all original tweets that used the hashtag Oscar so white and filtered them through tweet archiver and uploaded to Tableau public as my colleagues have done um, and compressed the information into easy to read visuals. 
um, that you will see shortly. I also categorized, categorized all Oscar nominees by category, actor, actress, director, etc., race, and sex. I specifically use the word sex as to avoid assuming the gender identity or expression of any Oscar nominees. The categorization I use to establish this data is exclusively information offered in the Oscars award database. I then analyze the change over time by race and sex for each of the major categories awarded by the Academy outside of actors and actresses. From the data I used gathering the tweets, I found that um, there was a stark difference between the frequency of the use of the tweet Oscar So White in these major cities, New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles, and the rest of the countries displayed. This shows that the effectiveness of the campaign in areas where films, or this shows that it was, the campaign was effective in um, parts of the country where films tend to be created and thus those who influence, influence filmmaking. This information is used to, um, to identify the difference between the amount of, the percentage of people um, who were who identified in a minority race or marginalized ethnicity before Oscar So White who were nominated in these four categories and after Oscar So White. So as you can see, there was an increase in every one of the categories. I would like to note though, that the producer data has been extracted from the best picture award, which is given to a film's producers. That being said, for a nomination in this data set to qualify as non-white or a female, only one of the producers nominated for any given film must identify in these categories. So, as I said, it's clear that before and after Oscar So White, the nominations for people identifying in a minority or marginalized race or ethnic group went up. For directors, it increased from 17% to 25% for editors from 7% to 10%. Producers being one of the larger ones, it doubled from 14% to 28% and writers the largest in this category from 5% to 25%. And this is the visualization that shows specifically what those numbers look like. So while it is still very sparse, um, there has been an increase in each of the categories from the five years prior to Oscar So White to the five years after. The same categorization was done for nominations over time by sex. Um, as I mentioned previously, for the producer category, only one of the producers in a group of producers who are awarded the Oscar for a film who, that is nominated for best picture needed to identify as, or not identify, sorry, to be noted as female. Uh, therefore, there appears to be a large amount of female um, producers who have been nominated. However, a majority of those only included one female out of four or five total produce, producers, sorry. So these also all, almost all increased. The directors who um, were nominated as females increased from 0% to 5%. Editors shockingly decreased from 20% to 15%, but the other two did also increase, producers being from 60% to 66%, and writers from 18% to 23%. After Oscar So White, a movement initially a satirical comment made toward Black Twitter gained mass amounts of attention, the film industry was forced to change its practices. While there are many variables in the creation and eventual nomination of films, the data suggests that the Twitter movement did have a positive effect on diversifying celebrated filmmaking at the Oscars ceremony. However, this has only encompassed the quantitative research and effectiveness of the numbers. While the data sets presented can offer quantitative reasoning for why hashtag Oscar so white can be deemed effective, it fails to analyze the reasons why this research even matters in the first place. This short film is intended to supplement the raw numbers with the history of human behavior in film and the, the emotions that follow it. 
I was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to create a short documentary entitled Cautiously Optimistic. Um, and in order to round out my presentation, um, I will play the last five minutes of this documentary um, in which interviewees, including Oscar So White creator, April Rain, Professor at Baylor University, Greg Garrett, activist and educator, Steph Woods, and professor at Syracuse University, Sharice Lepre Corsby Massey, and myself, discuss the power of hashtag Oscar So White and diversity in our representative culture that is film. I would first like to thank my editor, Alyssa Chang, and my graphics designer, Anish Ghosh, who are both students of color here at Syracuse University for their incredible work. Enjoy. Now, a couple years after the height of Oscar So White, there are new inclusion requirements for the biggest award there is, Best Picture. And this is largely due to visibility of the issues in the public eye. But for real inclusion to happen, we need fundamental change in filmmaking. What we need to continue to understand and encourage is that hashtag Oscar So White isn't just about non-white actors being cast but it can be and has been a catalyst for change in the industry. I will say Oscar So White gets, there's two real points I wanna make. I appreciate wholeheartedly that the Oscars is acknowledging behind the scenes, behind the camera, um, because the audience does not see that, all right? The audience sees the actors and the actresses, and that's why the actors and the actresses get so much weight. We don't stop to think, as, as audience, we don't necessarily think, you know, who's the camera person? Who's the race of the camera person? We know that there's an ongoing issue within the entertainment industry about lighting black people, you know, and, and how to use lighting properly so that, you know, it at dark, because we have more melanin in, in, in our skin, at night, you know, nighttime shots, you can still see who we are. You know, you can still see our facial expressions, which obviously in film um, and TV, you know, is very important. But it's the editor's responsibility to cut and paste those things together to ensure that we're getting the right shot with the right lighting, with the right angle for that particular person. And so I think people um, don't take as much thought about you know, the editor, I mean, it's the director's vision, but it's the editor who actually says, this is what's going to be on the screen. This is what um, consumers or, you know, theater goers are actually going to see. And so we need to be very mindful about who those people are as well um, and provide more opportunities to people from marginalized communities. And let me tell you something. The only thing that separates women of color from anyone else is opportunity. You cannot win an Emmy for roles that are simply not there. If people of color are not involved in all of those different ways of telling the story, then we are missing out on some of the, the real possibilities. People of color begin making their own movies for a mainstream audience. Pop culture, all right, popular culture, mainstream culture is visible. But this blank so white emerges in every single industry. We can talk about academia so white. We can talk about science so white. We can talk about finance so white. We can talk about government so white, right? So I think one of the things that I'd really like to see with Oscars so white is yes, a change in our symbolic culture, right? If movies and music and media um, is symbolic culture, it's a representation of our culture, it's also our culture. If that then activated people um, to look at how other industries are hashtag so white. My hope, my hope is that Hollywood will be uh, a more progressive force for us because there are lots of regressive forces in the culture pushing back against those achievements and trying to reimpose our racial mythologies. Um, and, and I think we really need a powerful cultural force 
um, to continue to move us in the direction of inclusion. I do feel consciously optimistic about the people who are going to be providing and producing content. I look past the clouds as I reach towards the sky The stars shine down on me telling me to move aside Cause the pretty people need the moonlight The pretty people need the moonlight Forgot how to sing in the span of one night Tore down all the things that held my heart and my pride Now I feel the weight on my shoulders Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Adriana Lobo. Good evening. I will start presenting my research presentation on the hashtag new namas. Hashtag Nuna Menos. So the purpose of my research is to understand that the hashtag Nuna Mas movement is to consider the Mexican government's impunity and the power of cultural memory to permit and justify gender-based violence and the violations of women's rights and conditions. Moreover, through the use of epistemologies and feminist theory of the flesh, coined by Cheri Moraga, a better comprehension and an analysis of social political aspects implicating and pressuring with urgency to mobilize can be achieved. Additionally, recognizing the necessity to hold those in power to their oath and commitments in protecting and serving its people through the implementation of existing legislation and policies, as well as recommendations from non-governmental organizations. More importantly to note, feminicides and feminicidios are not exclusive to Mexico. Objectives, the hashtag Mas movement, that of visualizations for victims and survivors, epistemologies, social and cultural tyranny, government impunity, and the conclusion. However, before I begin to present my research finding, I would like to give those in the audience a trigger warning because I will be presenting real life stories and cases. However, I do not intend to continue the rhetoric that violence against women is a tough or difficult conversation to have, nor do I want to continue or encourage the privilege when victims and survivors do not have a choice in witnessing such violences. Instead, I argue it is a necessity we must discuss. The hashtag Nyonamas movement. What is the movement? The hashtag Nyonamas movement is closely associated with the hashtag Nyonamenos since both are correlated to the torture and killing of queer Mexican poet and feminist activist Susana Chavez in 2011. Chavez was quoted before her death stating, Nyona mujer menos, Nyona muerta mas. Both hashtags bring awareness to the gender based violence. Latinx women face, including but not limited to feminicides. Just to give a bit of background, news outlets were suggesting Chavez left willingly with the men who raped her without considering Chavez openly identified as a lesbian and had no sexual interest in men. The police report also did not clarify the murder as a feminicidio, nor did they include the age of murder of the murderers who were minors. They implied Chavez was a prostitute as a form of justifying her own rape and murder. So from its very foundation, we notice impunity and the power of cultural memory to rely on victim blaming as a justification. Moreover, I would like to distinguish the difference between femicidios and feminicidios. So Diane Russell coined the term femicide in 19... Uh, 70. But Marcela Lagarde thought feminicidio would be a more appropriate term to represent experiences in Latin America and the Caribbean, meaning feminicidios, uh, femicidios, the homicide and murder of women. However, Marta Castañeda Salgado, along with Lagarde, made the distinction between feminicidio and femicidio by defining feminicidio as a process of incorporating the violations of rights and conditions of women rather than focusing solely on the single act of murder of women. Through this process, you are able to question the government's roles and decisiveness to prevent and eradicate such violences against women. So this is the hashtag Unamas movement. Um, it is a viral uh, speech that Zenia Zvandio, mother of Maria de Jose, gave at a protest in February 2020 um, for Ingrid Escamilla while also recognizing his, um, and recalling the fourth month anniversary of her daughter. And the video was translated in English by Al. Desera in 2020. In 
tengo todo el derecho a quemar y a romper. No le voy a pedir permiso a nadie, porque yo estoy rompiendo por mi hija. Y la que quiera romper, que rompa. Y la que quiera quemar, que queme. Y la que no, que no nos estorbe. Porque antes de que asesinaran a mi hija, han asesinado a muchas. ¿Y cómo estábamos todas? Tiene gusto en nuestra casa, llorando y bordando. Ya no, señores. Se acabó. Ya rompimos el silencio. Y no les vamos a permitir que hagan un maldito circo ya de nuestro dolor. Y si van a hablar, a mí de todas. Hablen de todas las que violan y acosan también los maestros y servidores públicos a las que les avientan ácido. Hablen de las niñas que violan en sus, en sus cunas, sus propios padres. Exijo justicia por mí, por mi familia y por mi hija. Y por todas las que nadie nombra. Porque todos los días se asesinan una y otra y otra. Y no he podido resolver el caso de mi hija. Y ya me llegaron 10, 100, mil casos más. More um, protests also took place in 2020. On March 8th, um, there was the celebration of the International Women's Day where 80,000 women marched to call for the end of gender-based violence. The following day on March 9th, an all-national women's labor strike was carried out the, with the hashtag Un Día Sin Nosotras, A Day Without Us. Um, and that's how we could see that women have been mobilizing themselves, um, fighting for their own lives and using their own voices and protesting for themselves and representing themselves because the government is not doing so by not implementing pre already existing legislation and policies. Um, data visualizations. So my data visualizations were compiled through Twitter archive where over 20,000 tweets. And the purpose of my data visualizations is to show that the hashtag Nuna Mas was utilized throughout Latin America and even other parts of the world to demonstrate that it's not an issue just exclusive to Mexico. It is um, through the different shading of colors throughout the, uh, the world how um, this hashtag was mostly used. Obviously, the darker the color, the darker, um, the more use of the hashtag. Followed by um, a compilation of, of how by day, when the hashtag was mostly used. In this case, it was a data collection, data collection between July 10th through August 30th, 2020, August 6th being the day that the hashtag was mostly used, which was the day that a 16-year-old Amber Cornejo was found murdered in Chile. And similarly, uh, this data collection was taken uh, through September 8th through November 30th of 2020. Um, essentially, on September 25th was the promotion of the street protest in Old San Juan, demanding the governor of um, Juan de Vasquez to call a state of emergency and followed by November 25th, an international united call to end violence against women and girls promoted by the Spotlight Initiative for the International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls and the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender Violence. Who are the victims and the survivors? We'll begin from in 1994 by three Tislan Indian sisters. The case was reported and documented in Overcoming Fear Human Rights Violation Against Women in Mexico by Amnesty International in 1996. Maria Teresa Mendez Santis, 20, Cristina Mendez Santis, 18, and Maria Mendez Santis, 16, um, were all tortured and raped on June 4th of 1994 by soldiers of the Mexican Army Neo Altamero in the state of Chiapas. They were detained at a military roadblock while returning with their mother to their community of Santa Rosita Sabaquil. This is another um, image of the case report, but essentially the sisters were accused of being part of the Ejército Zapatista Levaral, who argued for Mexico's autonomy and viewed agreements such as the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, would further impoverish indigenous communities. The sisters were not part of the uh, Ejército, but were tortured until they confessed, which they did not, but were raped by 10 soldiers before leaving. They got medical records and evidence to prove violations, but were threatened in coming forward along with those who helped them with their case. They were tried by the military court and lost for not being able to respond to summonings. They were not also given any apology or, or compensation till this day. Another case is the Cottonfield murders from 1993 to 2003. This is the case that gained attention to the feminicides of women, but also created the myth that serial killers are the ones raping and killing women. These women, one which is unknown, were almost unidentifiable by their own families. From the eight, four were found in a vacant lot, and the other four were found in a ditch. 
To memorialize them, the community placed pink crosses near the field where their bodies have been found and have also placed the bodies of other unidentified women. Although the image of the cotton field can only be found in newspaper archives because the area got replaced by the Conqueror Inn in 2011, people of the community will never forget. And then more recent cases that have helped fuel the hashtag Unamas movement are the, it was the killing of Fatima Cecilia, a seven year old was kidnapped after there was video evidence of her leaving school with an unknown woman. Her body was discovered days after her reporting missing. Her body was left mutilated in a plastic bag in a vacant lot. Her case is still an open investigation. Then we have the one of Ingrid Esquemia, a 25 year old who was horrifically murdered at the hand of her husband. He was found covered in blood, confessed to the murders and arrested. He claimed they got in a heated argument which caused him to skin and remove some of Ingrid's organs. This case is also still being investigated, epistemology. So through the use of a narrative, we are better able to comprehend gender-based violence. Theory of the flesh, which is a term coined by Cherry Moraga, famous queer uh, Chicano feminist, Moraga undoubtedly recognized for her contribution to a coalition of works by women of color, this bridge called my back in 1981, among many other of her works, such as Heroes and Saints and other plays in 1994, Theory of the flesh is where the physical realities of our lives, our skin color, the land or concrete we grew up on, our sexual longings all fuse to create a politic born out of necessity, which is the purpose of the hashtag Unamas movement. It's a politic born out of necessity. So after hearing the stories and cases of um, the horrific and tragic traumatizing realities that uh, these women face, it's also important to hear it from and, and learn from what's going also from the communities themselves. I will be playing in one moment. Visited. Now, instead of six social workers and nurses, it has just two. Eso habla de una visión totalmente sesgada y te das cuenta cómo regresa. Figueroa Morales says the government is regressing on women's rights, even though on paper, Mexico has many laws to protect women. They're just not enforced. One nurse who works at the women's hospital in Mexico City told me about a woman who was dumped there by her boyfriend. The woman was in shock because a hairbrush had been inserted in her vagina. Ya no tenía forma, su vagina. Como que estaba... Desformado. The nurse says a woman's vagina was shapeless, deformed, and she was bleeding. But instead of showing the woman compassion, the hospital staff talked about her with disgust. Comments like, the girl must have been really drunk not to have noticed. The women's hospital said it had no knowledge of the incident. On its website, it says women who've suffered violence should receive professional intervention that doesn't trivialize their trauma. The nurse, she says she never got a day of training about gender-motivated violence. It's supposed to be a hospital for women, to help women, she says. But confronted with this kind of situation, the staff is indifferent. And for some women in Mexico, the fight to stay alive can feel like a living death sentence. Like one mom, who's been living in shelters for two years with her son, changing locations every three months to avoid detection. Her husband works for the government, and she's terrified he'll use his connections to find them. I ask her, what's next? I don't know, she says. It's what fills me with despair and terror, because I don't know how this will end. For the world, Emily Green, Mexico City. So while we, after hearing the testimonies, I want you to all be able to take mental notes of all the issues and implications with those testimonials that these women have been facing. And this brings us to our point of social and cultural tyranny. Cultural tyranny, um, which was a term coined by, um, by Gloria Anzaldúa. However, a better term, more relevant to, To, to describe this is that cultural forms our beliefs. We perceive the versions of reality that it communicates that are transmitted to us through culture and is made by those in power, by men. The term much more uh, appropriate to define experiences that women face in Mexico and even in Latin America is machismo, which goes in hands with the parte So the silence of the bodies 
is a book that was written and composed by nine feminists born from the 70s and 80s in 2015. Honorable mentions of Orfa Alcaron, Susana Iglesias, and Tania Tangle, among others. Their work was intended to test the reliability of the deadly impact of gender-based violence on an entire community for what it means to live as a woman in the medium of violence, the role of writing in a world dominated by fear and terror, and the need to fight also from the literary field to eradicate violence against women, sexual harassment, feminicide, institutional violence, so that this does not happen to more. Meaning, media play plays a role in the portrayal of gender-based violence and writing sensationalist articles, which demean the efforts and cause victim blaming. More importantly, through the use of cultural memory, victims and survivors are not remembered as being the, with rights to human dignity, but as looking for it, for dedicating themselves to prostitution and for being out late. And this also goes into tie with the government and mutiny. So the North American Free Trade Agreement there was a documentary, The Performing the Border. It was the first documentary created by Ursula Biemann regarding the feminicides in Ciudad Juarez, in Mexico in 1999. The documentary explores the consequences of NAFTA and the key roles which in turn have become part of the ramification of gender-based violence in Mexico. Soon after NAFTA was established, factories called Maquiladoras were opened and they tended to hire poor young women with minimum education because they were perceived to be docile, meaning they were easily uh, being able to it be exploited. An interviewee in the performing at the board is shared that those women who could not be hired were limited to doing sex work or being domestic workers. Unfortunately, many employers would rec require them to have recommendations in order to be hired. So most were forced to do sex work. Being a sex worker or having to report to work at 5 a.m. is when it is dark has led to many feminicides to be reportedly. Sadly, they are not investigated or cared for because they are poor women who society deems as disposable. Moving on is military involvement. Um, Melissa W. Wright wrote Necro Politics and Necro Politics and Feminized Gender Violence on the Mexican US border in 2011. Wright expressed how rather than implementing existing protection for the rights and conditions of women, the Mexican government blamed gender based violence on cartels and organized crime. Therefore, they deployed troops throughout Mexico, but mostly in Ciudad Juarez, with support from the US to track down on drugs and crime rates. Essentially, a failed attempt on drug war on drugs because soldiers had no training like police, officer, police officers to handle police safety issues. And police officers had no intent either since most were brought off anyways, which is more evident with the lack of investigation and feminicidal cases reported. Military presence further impoverished the community because they became a hostile war zone. The killing of innocent people in the crossfires was basically justified because it was a risk taken in order to track down on drugs and crime. But in reality, women and children were trapped and left to experience the worst of it all. Understanding this social and political history is the result of approximately 10 women are murdered daily in Mexico, a rate that has doubled in the past five years. More than 40% of feminicide victims knew their killers. 93% of feminicide cases were not reported or investigated in 2018, and 77% of women in Mexico reported not feeling safe. And this brings me to my conclusion. It is important to continue to have these conversations or else the injustices will remain permanent and voiceless, meaning history will forever repeat itself, but the power is in those that preserve and find new and innovative ways to grasp justice. More importantly, building coalitions and finding solidarity among each other as feminicides are not exclusive and limited to Mexico. The first step is uniting in order to hold the government accountable and to pressure the implementation of existing legislation and policies for the protection of women's rights and conditions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm super humbled um, and honored to just be in partnership with uh, my peers at Syracuse University. Um, at this time, I would like to open up the floor to Dr. Neil and Dr. Abdugani um, to see if you have any responses to, to the, the beautiful work and the necessary critical work um, of my um, fellows. I will defer to Dr. Neil first since I've worked with the fellows for the past two years. 
Yeah, I can't seem to turn on my camera, but I'll I'll just speak um, with just the audio. Uh, you know, it was amazing to see, you know, one, the idea of being able to double down on all of the presentations around the use of hashtags. Um, I, I imagine, and this is the brilliance of the way that the platform's been utilized, you know, this was not something that the creators of the technology were using, right? And, and if you think about the, the ways in which technology have been used to marginalize and oppress um, different people, in, in this case, particularly in the context of gender, you know, there's something extraordinary about flipping the technology on its head to be able to intervene in the kinds of conversations that uh, we saw, you know, all of these young scholars able to intervene on. Um, I mean, just simply my reaction to it, they were, they were extraordinary presentations and speak a great deal about the work that's being done at the center um, and the fact that this is productive work, right? It's work that doesn't end at this moment, right? But speaks both to uh, intellectual and scholarly possibilities, but also real interventions into political moments in which these interventions are needed. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Um, Marcel, did you want to say something? No, I also just echo, um, you know, what, what has been said, the presentations um, were amazing. And I just feel proud to have been a part of um, helping to create a space for this uh, work to be done. Uh, but I think if we have a, a few moments, I don't know if there are any questions um, Evan, that you see in, in the chat, we are um, coming close to an end, um, but we certainly want to provide an opportunity if there's anything that people want to address um, to the panel of scholars. Oh, sorry, my computer uh, was a little bit funny for a second. No, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Um, I will just say that um, all of the presentations that you saw here today and all of the scholarship that went into this project will be um, presented in a website that will also be put on the Linder Center's website um, in May. Um, so stay on the lookout for that. Um, subscribe to our Linder email list um, and to our social media accounts. And I just wanted to thank everybody for attending tonight. Uh, so thank you, in, everyone. In uh, in closing up here at the end here, I'll just uh, say that you know this question of justice is both ancient and always present, always urgent. And these amazing students and our incredible Linder Center faculty fellow, Dr. Al Bugani, uh, have inaugurated our center's effort to engage in this ongoing struggle to find answers to this ever urgent question of justice. So we thank them. We're humbled by their amazing work. And we're thankful to all of you for joining us in this struggle. And finally, I would just say, I, we welcome you uh, to return to the Lender Center in April 16th and 17th for the Lender Center Conversation. This year, the Lender Center Conversation will focus on a very relevant theme, policed bodies, a community conversation on race, disability, and justice. We'll welcome Dr. Monique Morris and a distinguished set of panelists involved in national and local conversations about transforming policing practices towards a more equitable, inclusive, accessible, and just community. We hope to see you then. And in the meantime, stay well.